Happy Sunday, friends and lovers. Thank you for joining us. This is Five Minutes with Robert Naser. I am Robert Naser, and I am joined, as always, by the lovely, charming, and brilliant Amy Naser. Hello there, everybody. And all of you, and you know who you are. This is Sunday, December 6th, the 341st day of 2020. <laughs> there are 25 days remaining until 2021, which is going to be awesome, the best year ever, the best year yet. Cannot wait. And speaking of things I just can't wait for, there are just 19 days left until Christmas. <laughs> Hope you got into your shopping early like I told you to do, even though I haven't finished mine yet. Just <laughs> under three weeks left until the holiday and 329 days until Halloween. Yay! Hope we took advantage of those post-Halloween sales. <laughs> we didn't, but price no object. And on this date, September 6th, mm -hmm. in 1884, the Washington Monument was completed. Oh, that's really cool. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't think that was, you know, things I didn't know about the Washington Monument. When the new federal capital, Washington, D.C., was designed, you know, cities have architects, and when the new capital was designed in 1791, mm. in the late 1700s, a space was left at the end of the National Mall, you know, the big, the big yeah. park, that big area. A space was left for a monument in okay. 1791. It wasn't until 1832 mm -hmm. that action was taken to design and build it. Wow. But actually, that's just when the fundraising began. Okay. How are we going to get the money to build this enormous... They had an enormous monument in mind. Raise the national debt to uh, $30 trillion? That's the amazing thing is they didn't just say, <laughs> let's print the money. No, they actually raised the money. Yay! <clears throat> so construction finally began 16 years later on July 4th. Worth the wait. July 4th, 1848. Now wait... It gets better. Okay. Six years later, mm -hmm. still building. All right. With funds running low, the construction was halted. Mm. Civil War. Oh. Time goes by. No further progress was made until so how, how 1876. Wow. Okay, well, that's the centennial. So, the centennial um, of the American Revolution, the American Independence. How tall independence. did they get it? How tall was it standing for all of those decades? When they stopped, it was only 150 feet tall. It was 27% of the way up. <laughs> and in 1876, President Ulysses S. Grant, a guy who at that point I think could get anything he wanted, Authorized the completion of the monument. Excellent. The Washington Monument is 554 feet and 7 and 11 three, 30 seconds inches tall. Do we have a comparison with another structure? It was actually the tallest structure in the world mm. at the time. That's great. And it was only superseded five years later by the Eiffel Tower, Okay. which surpassed 1,000 feet. 1,063 oh. feet, so not quite twice as tall. But when it was built, the Washington Monument was the tallest structure in the world. Well, that is wonderful. Yes. So, happy birthday to the Washington Monument, which they finally finished building. And it still stands today. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, too, if you ever see it, or you can even see this in pictures, you can sh see the shading of the marble that was used changes a bit after that first Choice. just more than a quarter you know, yeah right because the stone that was available you know yeah. 40 years prior wasn't the same sure and i'm sure the first stone was a bit weathered that too yeah. yes it's it's i didn't run the numbers but yeah 40 years older whatever right. it is today is also saint nicholas day yay or feast day or the feast of saint nicholas the bishop nicholas of myra 14th, 4th, excuse me, 4th century Greece. Yes, at uh, least that's what they say. <laughs> yes. Well, you've got the definitive story there. This is the definitive Christmas book. Um, this is called the Encyclopedia of Christmas. The by The World Encyclopedia by of Christmas. Jerry Bowler. Jerry Bowler. Who is a prolific writer about Christmas and Santa Claus, and I highly recommend his work. So every time we look up anything for Christmas, this seems to be your go-to book. I love this book so much. I have it so, there's so many marks in it, and... <laughs> Um, yeah, so St. Nicholas, 
I know we talked about it a little bit about the history of Santa Claus last time, but uh, there's no, as it says here, there is no evidence of his life and career existing. <laughs> There's no evidence of his life or career existing? Yes, yes. So, you mean there's no remaining evidence or there's no evidence that he ever existed? Right. There's there's only, um, you know, handed down through the Catholic Church and such. And um, and basically, you know, he was one of those saints where um, there was a body in uh, Myra in Turkey hmm. um, that the uh, Catholic Church um, <laughs> stole uh, basically, in 1087, his remains in Myra, a town that had fallen into Islamic hands, uh, they were kidnapped from their resting place in an Orthodox church and taken to Bari, Italy, where they become became a focus of the, a new Catholic basilica. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, now here, I was going to present this as settled science. <laughs> so but some, it sounds like there there's some... Con- how could we have someone's all of these traditions if, if this guy didn't... <laughs> Oh, you mean he just might not have been exactly what we're told he was. Right. Yeah, okay. here, here it says that, you know, he was born in Turkey and such. Um, uh, and he had he shown signs of his holiness very early on, standing up to praise God the moment he was born and refusing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as soon as he was born and just come out of his mother's room, he stood up and says, praise Jesus. So, um, <laughs> See, that's funny because my sources, which, you know, are just history.com and wikipedia this is a very thorough book <laughs> actually it says saint nicholas was born in 270 a.d and then it mm-hmm. says parenthetically although he was not considered a saint at birth yeah. now i thought that was a bit of a joke but given what you're reading that they're telling stories of he got up and saluted and the cross from did, day one not only that but he refused his mother his mother's milk on fast days so when he was a little he baby knew when he was supposed to fast yes he knew the pa- the fast days, and he refused his mother's milk. Holy um, heck! <laughs> then it says he is said to have been imprisoned under the persecuting emperor um, Diocletian, released under Constantine, and as a bishop of Myra in Asia Minor, to have attended the <laughs> three hundred the three twenty five year three twenty five Council of Nicaea, where he was alleged to have smacked the um, heretic Aurelius. Ar- 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 so, so. <laughs> well, anything the Council of Nicaea came up with is definitely that's that's the gold standard right there. So, whatever they say it goes. goes on and on and on. His um, after his death, Nicholas became a well-loved saint, being named the patron, among other things, of Russia and Greece, and of Vikings. Vikings. Choir boys. Thief. Vikings and choir. Not typically no, no. known for defending the poor and. Uh, thieves. thieves. He was the patron saint of thieves, per- okay. perfumers, barrel makers, unmarried women, and sailors. Medieval sailors on the Mediterranean would not venture aboard a ship without Nicholas loaves, bread that could be thrown overboard to a miraculously calm stormy seas. <laughs> so- unmarried women. <laughs> so, and it goes on a little bit... Um, uh, by 1100, he was associated with the Christmas season. And uh, basic, yeah, his feast day is tonight. So if you want to have a big dinner, put in honor of St. Nicholas. Uh, by the 16th century, German children were hanging out their stockings for him to drop presents in. So this goes on and on. And um, Yeah, my understanding is that <laughs> he originally put coins for the poor in their shoes. And yes. that sort of developed into putting gifts in stockings. That but there is are some right. some places in the world they still celebrate by leaving out a boot. That's correct, and then I believe in I think Norway perhaps or or Scandinavia or Sweden or something like that. Um, yeah, they have the boot out, and in the morning you can get a bunch of candy out of your shoe or boot. Mm. Yes. So anyway, interesting. So he's a very interesting guy. There's a picture of him in this encyclopedia. He looks like um, he looks like a Klingon uh, from the Star Trek. Uh, stories. <laughs> uh, okay. He's got the lovely forehead ridges. <laughs> Very nice. So anyway, to St. Nicholas, everybody. That's Hooray. right. So how to celebrate St. Nicholas Day. Have a feast. Mm. St. Nicholas Day is also commonly known as the Feast of St. Nicholas, and it's widely celebrated in Europe. To celebrate December 6th, have a feast with your family and friends. There's nothing wrong with splurging. Help someone in need. 
Just like St. Nicholas was known to do, a great way to celebrate this day is to follow in his footsteps and help somebody in need. Well, I'm all for that if it's actually good people that you actually care about. So you do I, that. I had this idea of, yes. I, and I couldn't find it. I need to find a charity that will help out unemployed, um, you know, gentlemen who dress up as Santas. Yes, unemployed Santas. Yes. I really want to help them because, you know, if that if there was anybody who was very much deserving of charity at this time of Christmas, it's... The unemployed Santas. That's right. Because Especially they, because they're very special people. They are, you know, they're, there's, they're all over in all the department stores, and yet, magically, they each become the real Santa Claus when they're yes. needed. So this has got to be a tough year for them, sitting at home and having to sit on all that magic. Right. Nobody's sitting on their laps. Mm-mm. I'm a sad person with no one sitting on my lap, so <laughs> I have every sympathy for that. And last but not least, decorate your own stocking or special St. Nicholas boot. Yes. This would this is now I'm reading from uh, history.com. This would make a great decoration around St. Nicholas Day. Buy a pair of cheap boots or do it yourself with an old pair. Mm. I don't know if I want to eat candy that somebody left in one of my old shoes. I'm uh, I'm a fairly hygienic person, but even to <laughs> me that that doesn't got to go just, and I know gentlemen got, who I definitely wouldn't want ox, you know, anything to keep in their boot. It. <laughs> Oxyclean. That's right. Order now, and we'll send you twice as many. And turn them into a unique decoration to sit in front of your fireplace for St. Nicholas Day. Well, there you go. And Linda of, of Cordaire.com, Linda Cordaire, lovely Linda, she says, in Germany, we put our shoes outside our bedroom doors for, for treats. treats. That's right. Yeah, yes. It's much more European than it is in the States. We're all like, give me a stocking that was made just for this that my feet have never actually been in. Oh, but if you're a kid, it doesn't matter. Well, that's true. If you're, if you're a kid, <laughs> just matter. about anything goes. If there's treats in your boots, in treats in your dirty socks, doesn't matter. There are treats. So we could spend the whole podcast talking about St. Nicholas. But under the category, what are we listening to this week? Yes. Amy, Amy has been listening to God a Tay. It's a song. In preparation for the holidays. Yes, it's and a great song. In all of its many, many flavors. <laughs> it's, mm. of course, it is about the baby Jesus. Yes, it is a Christmas, or not a Christmas, but a reverential song. You, Excuse me, I'm drinking hot chocolate. I um, am wearing red stripes for Christmas. You see that? That's beautiful. If you're on Apple Podcasts, you just have to take me at my word. Just and, imagine the gloriousness of it. And the drink of the evening is hot chocolate. Mm, yum. Yeah, I did not spike it this time because my, my brain cells are precious and limited, so I need all I can get. So Gaudete in Latin, it translates to rejoice. Rejoice? Yes. Oh, so it's not God, uh, not like no. God, Gaudete. <laughs> okay, I just sounded kind of gaudy, that's all. So it's uh, it was composed in the 16th century. And a collection. It was uh, from. Um, it was taken from a collection of Finnish Swedish sacred songs published in 1581. So um, it's it's a oh, great song. Say something else. I've got a marshmallow going here. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so basically, you know, it's about the um, you know hmm. Christ is born of the Virgin Mary. Rejoice. Neat. Yes, and uh, um, Penn and Teller could reproduce that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure they could. I'll bet. I'll but bet. it's, it's probably a lovely, good explanation. It's okay. a lovely, lovely um, song. It is. And I plan on recreating it on my my alto saxophone, which I've got to get out and dust off. But you also wanted to do a hardcore rock version of it. I did. I want to, I want to do a punk rock version of it. We'll see if we can pull that one off. Yes. So, Amy is listening to God of Tay. What I'm recommending this week is the fanciful, whimsical film Amelie. Yes. Or La Fabulo Destine de Amélie Poulon. You would have to pronounce this with your much better understanding of French. Mm -hmm. But the film Amélie, the American name is simply Amélie, without subtitle, or with subtitles, yes. without a subtitle name of the film anyway. Mm -hmm. Starring Audrey Tautou, mm -hmm. or as Americans say, Audrey Tatau. It, yeah, something yes. like that. Audrey Tautou. And there, there is... Um, a scene in the film and the link to this scene is in the show notes so you can click this afterward and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Those of you who've seen the film will already know this. Uh, in which Amelie's co-worker Gina is screening a gentleman, a potential love interest of Amelie's, not hers, uh, the boy Nino. Mm -hmm. 
and she's screening him by asking him to complete a series of sayings, or as she calls them, proverbs. Yes. Like, a rolling stone... Gathers no moss. Yes. Or absence... Makes the heart grow fonder. So she asks him these, and because he's able to successfully complete them, she knows he's a man of some character. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a quirky thing, but it's a very quirky movie. I should warn anybody who's going to see this film, I've recommended it to people, and it's almost always received positively, but it's very whimsical. Yes. It's very fanciful. It is. And um, and, and there's a couple of slightly adult sequences in it. A little bit. Which are a little out of place in something so light and silly. Yes. So if you're sensitive to that... Um, you know, hit the skip 30 second button on your player. Exactly. That's all you need to do. Do what you got to do. But this has got me thinking about aphorisms. Mm-hmm. And earlier this week, Amy, you asked me, um, or you told me, I should write down my I aphorisms. Asked, I asked you. Uh, she told me to catalog <laughs> my some of my wisdom, specifically the, the, the sayings. Mm-hmm. And that gets into the question, well, what is an aphorism and what is a saying? And So I went to Merriam-Webster as part of this project, and said, Merriam-Webster, what is an aphorism? And I went to Wikipedia, and they had some good definitions, too. But Merriam-Webster said, mm-hmm. Miriam said, if I can be so bold, <laughs> aphorism, a concise statement of a principle, or two, a terse formulation of a truth or sentiment. Mm-hmm. So principle, truth, or sentiment, and concise or terse Mm-hmm. Terse. Terse. Sounds a little judgmental. So then the question is, well, what is a proverb? And they define a proverb as a brief, popular epigram or maxim. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Well, that makes sense. Wait a minute. Do I really know what a maxim is? Do I know what an epigram is? Epigram, a terse, sage. See, now we're bringing wisdom into it. Mm. Terse, sage, or witty. Often paradoxical saying and often presented satirically. Oh. So epigram has got that edgy thing going on. Oh, well. Uh, a maxim is a general truth, fundamental principle or rule of conduct. So that's kind of ruley, kind of mm-hmm. tell you what to do kind of thing. And adage, a saying, often metaphorical, that embodies a common observation. So that left me thinking, okay, I think I've got a handle on what an aphorism is and, and why they call it just a concise statement of a principle or a terse formulation of a truth or a sentiment. Except that I was left with, well, what's a saying? So Merriam-Webster says a saying is something said. <laughs> That's so deep. A saying is something that is said. I thought, man. Said. You know, when it's said. That means that everything I've ever said is a saying. (laughs) Well, okay. A definition doesn't actually replace a concept. We all know that. Thus spoke At least all the objectivists out there know that. Yes. Yes. But we do have um, a couple of nice um, aphorisms here. Perhaps some general truths from our friends. Mary Aileen says... I prefer my treats without shoes. I prefer my treats without shoes. I don't know if that's an aphorism, but it's probably good advice. (laughs) Yes. But Jennifer, Jennifer has a nice one. She says, a great pair of shoes can be a treat. You know, that that is so true. That's a general truth for sure. And I learned that one kind of late in life. (laughs) Um, Because for me, a great pair of shoes is a comfortable pair of shoes. It's Yes. Yes. I've worn shoes that looked good that I will never wear again. And I know some people are slaves to fashion. Excuse me, I know some people prioritize appearances, and that's great. But for me, a great pair of shoes is a comfortable pair of shoes. So give me a set of rock ports over hush puppies any day and twice on Sunday. Your outside needs to match your inside. So if your inside is really, really uncomfortable, wear an uncomfortable pair of shoes. Oh, (laughs) <laughs> so sometimes honesty can demand cruel shoes. Yes. Cruel shoes being one of Steve Martin's early books. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yes. It was uh, a short story, a number of short stories. One of them was about a set of cruel shoes people couldn't resist wearing. Um, it got to where apparently they were wearing them because it's absurdity. It's Steve Martin. Steve Martin absurd. Yeah. Well, he's also the one, because you mentioned... Um, single women. Mm. He's also the one who said that he's um, he's all behind single mothers. Oh, yes. Especially helping them get their start. <laughs> yes. 
<sighs> Welcome to so. my world, Steve Martin. So, <laughs> uh, he's just like St. Nicholas, you know. So the funny thing is, Amy says, you need to catalog your aphorisms. Yes. And I said, I don't know what any of my aphorisms would be. And that's the funny thing about this is I drew a blank. I think, well, what, what, are, what are my aphorisms? And she listed a couple off and, yes, and as reminded I me of what they were. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And then they all come piling, oh, yes. you know, uh, flowing out of my head. <laughs> so the point is, for an aphorism to be yours... It needs to be a part of your thinking, you know, integrated, mm -hmm. and b part of your habits. Okay. You know, automatic or semi-automatic. So it's not just some sort of highfalutin uh, sentencing or or anything or sayings. It's well, something that you need to practice and actually apply to your life. When 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 Amy says to me, "Your aphorisms," you know, mm -hmm. she's not just saying, "What's a list of aphorisms you like." Mm -hmm. What are your aphorisms? Yes, Robert Nacer aphorisms. What is your wisdom? So that's why I realized, okay, at first I drew a blank because to me these are automatic. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not aphorisms, they're well, just okay. Robert. The, the, we're patiently waiting. Come on, come on, get to it. <laughs> well, oh, you want examples? <laughs> yes. Okay, so I did list a few of them to get us going here. But I'll tell you what, people responded in my post earlier this week about what are your aphorisms. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to read a few of those. And they did a great they job. So Thank good. you for, for participating in that on we, our 5 Minutes with Robert Nacer Facebook page. Yes, and some of them are mine in the sense that I live by them even though they don't come to that. So number one, everybody knows what's the one thing I say all the time. We are surrounded by miracles. Mm -hmm. Now, at least of which is ourselves. I've explained that one time and again. Everybody's getting sick of it. But the short answer is we are surrounded by the products of reason yes. and a division of labor society, mm -hmm. by things that we could never by ourselves on a deserted island have created. Right. And we get to take advantage of these values. We get to capitalize on all this beneficence. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's a Robert Nacer, Nacer aphorism, know your purpose. Now, here I'm not talking about your life's purpose, although that's part of it. But know your purpose in any given moment. You should know what you're doing right now mm -hmm. and why. To what end are you doing it? If you're listening to this podcast, it may be as simple as, oh, I want to hear some kindred spirits, or oh, it's kind of funny, and, or oh, it just helps me pass the time while I've got more important things to do. Yeah. Whatever your reason. Uh, I've said yeah. before, if you're calling somebody on the phone, oh, I'm calling them, well, what do you want to accomplish on that phone? What do you mean, what do you want to accomplish? Well, you want to make a connection. You want to confirm your next time you're going to talk or get together. You want to let that person know you're thinking about them or you love them. Mm -hmm. If you actually think that out before you hit the send button or the call button, you will have a better phone call. You will. And if you do that throughout your life in any given moment, know what you're doing and why. I think that's what the um, the current hui uh, say, uh, sayers, <laughs> that's what they call intentionality. Intentionality. Yes. Yeah, well, I'm going to elevate that above hui. Uh, <laughs> I may do it with these little aphorisms yes. here. Number three is, in any given moment, mm -hmm. that's it. That's the whole aphorism. It's something that I say to myself in a lot of different contexts, <laughs> is that right now, yeah. well, that's intentionality. That's mindfulness. That's, right. are you here? Am and I here? So, are we here? Are you listening to me right now? Take a moment just to realize, oh yeah, I'm whatever. I'm at work. I'm in the car. I'm doing my thing. And yeah, these guys are doing their podcast and I'm listening to them and just that slight level of heightened awareness can change everything. I see. So right now is is a little different, though, than in any given moment. Because uh, that's a little bit more general. Well, what I mean is that in this moment okay. or in the next moment. In this moment. In any given moment. In yeah. other words, people think, well, now is not a time for me to... Mm. think about gratitude or now is not a time for I don't need to know my purpose or now is not a time for me to be taking action or now is not a time and what you want to do is you want to upset that apple cart you want fresh thinking you want to always be thinking in any given moment yes I so, could be more focused in any given moment I could be more generous in any given moment right now 
So it's basically um, a way to start off um, helping yourself visualize what you want to do or what you could do. Visualize, um, yes. Yes. And realize and motivate. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes just that bit of awareness is curative. It gets you out of a rut. Yes. And that leads to number four, which is in any given moment, you can change anything. You can change everything. Mm. Even the things you can't change, you can change your perspective on them. True. You find a roadblock, you can if you can't beat it, you can go around it. Mm -hmm. In any given moment, you could change everything. And that goes along with the idea that if you change one thing, you change everything because everything is connected. Okay. If I can't fix this, I can do this other thing that then makes that less of a problem or less of a roadblock. Anyway, that's another Robertism. In any given moment, you could change everything. Okay. Yeah, it makes me wonder at what point did, for example, Quint and Linda decide, oh, let's open a second gallery. In Jackson, Wyoming. <laughs> at, so, at some point, they had that, and yeah. you know, it may have developed, it may have, it may have built up over the course of time. Right. But how many people would have thought, if they were running a, a small successful gallery in a charming California city like Napa, mm -hmm. to, well, let's go to Wyoming and open a second gallery. And of course, we'll need a second place to live, a second home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At what moment that, did that come to them? Did they decide that they were going to pursue that? Yes. What, what moment did they open themselves up and visualize that and say, you know what, this could be possible? And even if the idea developed over the course of time, or they knew people in Wyoming, or they knew resources they could use, and it built up and built up and built up. But at some point, there is the decision that yes, we're going to do it, mm -hmm. and uh, we all we all need more of that. Yes. Number five. And this is another one you've heard before. Treat others. Yes. Not as they deserve to be treated, but as you deserve to treat them. That's one of my very favorites. You are not the world's policeman. Mm -hmm. It is not your responsibility to right every wrong. Right. It is not your responsibility to carry the baggage of everything that's ever been done to you. True. You know, justice demands that, in some cases, you do have to exact that justice. Mm -hmm. But there's more to it than that, which I'll get to in a minute. Number seven. Or excuse me, number six. Okay. I said treat others not as they deserve to be treated, but as you deserve to treat them. Number six. Treat yourself the same way. Hmm. Treat yourself the way you deserve to treat yourself. Yes. Speaking of the Corderas, Quint Cordera has a great quote. I recently put it up again, even though it was from years ago. Mm -hmm. He said, you don't deserve, no one deserves to be their own harshest critic mm -hmm. without also being their most dedicated fan. Yes. That's great. It is. So, treat yourself the way you deserve to be treated. Which is why number seven is be who you are. Mm -hmm. That one sounds ridiculous. Of course, be who you are. I am who I am. I can't be anybody but who I am. And yet, sometimes we are not true to who we are. We don't, we don't actually live our own identity. And people will say, well, then that's part of your identity too. Obviously, we're going for something a little deeper there. Mm -hmm. Live your values. That's why yes. number eight is be who you deserve to be. Yes. Because that's sort of the, the sum of the prior two. Okay, okay. So there's a distinction between those two because the, the first one, Be yes. Who You Are, is actually yep. um, similar or almost exact to a Frederick Nietzsche quote. Really? What yes. did Nietzsche say? Be Who You Are. <laughs> oh. So, okay. But he said well, it, I, I might have got that from His him. framework is such that um, he was an existentialist. So the idea of just, you know, you need to be who you are. It's sort of like... You know your 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 blood and your sinew and and your um, you know ah. in other words and, and and your emotions. Yes. Um. You know, don't not, don't examine who you are. Don't what was the last one? Don't don't be who you deserve to be. Yes. Um. Don't evaluate. Um. And he wasn't a big believer in free will either. Yes. Um. So he wasn't a believer in reason or didn't consider reason. Um. He was a big believer in. Um, your will mm -hmm. and uh, your desires and, and not necessarily examining them before you act on them. Um, so yeah, be who, be who you are. Yeah. To him, it was a more of an existentialist sort of 
uh, it's, assertion. It's a common existentialist answer to the the question of free will versus determinism Mm -hmm. is, well, you are determined, but you can fall back on your animal nature, (laughs) your your lusts, your will, your (laughs) id. And uh, it kind of reminds me there are people who will tell you the the answer to the free will issue is indeterminism in quantum mechanics. Mm. You know, there's randomness there. And to me, that's the same as Friedrich Nietzsche saying, your will, that's, that's where... Things are, yeah. you know, that's where you've got control. As a former Nietzschean existentialist as a teenager, i got to say now, Frederick Nietzsche is a big bag of mixed nuts. He's a big bag. Emphasis on the nuts. <laughs> but there's so much good in Nietzsche. If you just, you know, if you're young and you're looking for somebody to tell you you're not cheap, you're not a pawn, you yeah, can if, be self-assertive, you can be like the Zarathustra. Right. If uh, I do have some Nietzsche quotes, if we do have time um, later on here, but good. Yeah, we'll see if there's any other that I got from him. And we also have some uh, comments um, of uh, of aphorisms that good. people like to share. Well, so. I'll be reading some from the thread too. Yes. So real quick here, number nine. As I said, you are not the world's policeman. Sometimes the best place to put those who don't serve your values or ends. It's not in jail. It's not at the end of your fist. Sometimes the best place to put those who don't serve your values or ends is in your rear view mirror. Mm-hmm. Just make them go away by leaving them. Yes. Now, some people, you know, say, let it go. I don't think that really gets the point. Mm-hmm. Because, number 10, the greatest punishment I can inflict on those who've betrayed me, or let me down, the greatest revenge, the greatest justice, is my absence. Mm, that's so sad. It so is. sad for them. It is. There's a line, uh, Joan Cusack, I think, in Gross Point Blank. Mm, yes. Um, I love that movie. <laughs> says, as the guy who's, you know, this bad guy who's trying to come on to her and restart their romance, she says, you, you don't get it. You don't get me. Or you don't get to have me. Well, that's what yeah. she meant. But yes. the words were, you, you don't, don't get, get me. me. Yeah. And that's that's the revenge that I take out on people who have betrayed me. Yeah. Or, just, you don't get me yeah. in your life. Right. I don't have to punish you. I don't have... Sometimes I do punish them. Sometimes <laughs> revenge is appropriate. But in general, yeah, I just leave them. Right. And that's... You don't get to me in your life anymore. Yeah. And I should say that we're... Neither of us are really big. I, I used to be much more big into revenge. Uh, but you you really never have. You've always just kind of put people in the rearview mirror, and that's I've okay. Been there, you know. And, I, and I've done that when it's necessary. It's the yeah. point that people miss is that most of the time it's not necessary. Right. Sometimes it is. Sometimes you got to be that policeman. Yes. But people have a mistaken idea of what justice demands. Yes. That if enough bad things happen to you, you've got to spend the rest of your life mm-hmm. trying to make everybody else fly right, mm-hmm. and that just no, nope. it's not rational. Right. Number 11, the flip side of that is you deserve the spotlight. You've heard me say this before. You deserve to be in the spotlight at least now and then. So, damn it, stand on the table. Mm -hmm. Get up there where people are going to look at you and see you. And whether they cheer or whether they laugh, you need to be the center of attention. (sighs) Something that came to me recently that I've, I've thought before, but I probably have needed it more this year, which is, I am larger than anything I am going through or dealing with. I'm sure that one's not original with me. Right. It's so good. But sometimes I have to remind myself of the things that I've already transcended Mm -hmm. to realize, oh, God, I'm so much bigger than these things that seem like roadblocks, that seem like challenges, that seem like enormous disappointments. I'm so much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. My resources are so much greater than that. Uh, the, my my mind, my rational faculty can handle so much more than that. I've got so much more creativity than just banging my head on this thing. Right. And there are ten ways around it. That's excellent. Uh, number 13, this might be the most important one on the whole list. Values are primary. Mm-hmm. It's another one I've repeated, and I'm not done repeating it. Threats to your values must be dealt with and then let go of. That's my 97-3 rule. Yes. 97% of your time and resources should be spent on values. 3%'s got to be spent on defending yourself against threats to your values. Right. 
but, and I'm sure the Corderas would agree with this, you are not here to not die. <laughs> yes. You are here to live. Yes, not dying is not living, as they would say. Yes. Yes. Uh, and then real quick, two more. 14. Context is everything. Mm-hmm. I love that expression because it's actually a joke or a tautology. Okay. What does context mean? It means to take everything into account that's relevant to a given situation or, or information. Right. Specify it. Context literally is everything. So keeping context all the time mm-hmm. should be a goal. Rationality means keeping context. You are alive and you are a rational animal. That gets to where you are bigger than anything that happens to you. You are a rational animal. I know. We have really large brains. You have the faculty (laughs) of reason. Oh my gosh. We have really, you know, we have decent uh, functioning senses. We really do. um, United Negro College Fund mm-hmm. used, to, used to have ads, I think maybe they still do, that said, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Yes. The converse of that is that a mind is an incredible thing. It is. You are an incredible thing. You, you, each of you listening right now, you hearing my voice, you are amazing. Yep. If anything is of value in this world, it begins with you. There are no... Uh, intrinsic values out there. Mm -hmm. Everything is a value to or for someone. Every value in the world is a value to you, or it doesn't matter at all. You are larger than any one thing. Mm -hmm. So I like the expression, this too shall pass. Oh, which uh, Andrea has already mentioned in the comments. Wonderful. (laughs) Because you are bigger than anything that ever had. And if you're not bigger than it, you know, there are tragedies. There are life-changing tragedies. Yes. And... You know, in those cases, you do what you've got to do because rationality says, you know, primacy of existence and the things that happen come first. Mm -hmm. But most things aren't like that. Yes. And then my last one here. You only live once. But if you live right, once is enough. Mm -hmm. And you are enough. Yes. Because you get to decide what is enough. And that's enough. That's enough aphorisms. Let's take a look at what other (laughs) folks are saying here. Yep. Um, Do you want to start uh, with what we have right right in front of me here? Or do you want to start with... What have you uh, got there? Let's do a couple live ones real quick before I go back to the list. All right. So we have... um, uh, Give us us some juicy ones. Well, Angie says, time will tell. Time will Mm -hmm. tell. Yep. Yes. It kind of goes along with uh, one of my favorite, actually. I think it's from Shakespeare. It's... The truth will out. Truth will out. Yes. And time will tell. <laughs> yes. Um, Andrea says, uh, oh, don't break a bird's wing and tell it to fly. Mm-hmm. Now, that's great. Yeah. Especially because we're a pro-capitalist show here. Yes. And how often does the government break our wings and then tell us, why are you producing? Why aren't you keeping the economy running? <laughs> yes. Don't break a bird's wing and then tell it to fly. Don't uh, knock down your spouse or partner and then ask them, why aren't you a better you know, companion or lover or whatever? Yep. A- Angie says hindsight is twenty twenty. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, 2020 is a mess, but 2021 is just, what did I say, 25 days away. <laughs> hindsight is 2021. Yeah, hind end is 2020. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of the ones we've got here are... are Historically, you know, great nature to be commanded must be obeyed. Mm-hmm. Uh, a is A, of course, we have a lot of great Ayn Rand here. Uh, Laurie Rice said, character is fate. You know, that's, that's mm-hmm. Aristotle. You, you, your life be, is your character. Right. Man's character is his fate. Yes, actions speak louder than words. <laughs> I love that Emily Drake said, everything in moderation including moderation. I love that, because Heinlein said, take big bites out of life, moderation is for monks. <laughs> yes. So, so Emily you know, implies that moderation does have its place, and that's good. Uh, Holly says, to thine own self be true. It's a great one. Yes, to thine self be true. That's great, and that's Shakespeare too. Um, 
There's a lot that were that, that were humorous, but there's a few that seem humorous but are actually wise. Mm-hmm. So Rob Flitton said, you know, the grass is greener where you water it. Yes, yes. You know, people are always like, the grass isn't greener on the other side. That's the other side of the fence. You think everybody's got it better, but they don't really. I love this. The grass yeah. is greener where you water it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Cast your bread upon the waters and it shall return to you many fold. <laughs> I like Rob's better than the Bible, though. That's good. Is that Nicholas bread? Would the sailors cast it upon the water to ensure calm seas? Yes. <laughs> I'm sure that's it. That's what it is. <laughs> yes. Andrea also said, life is short. Smile while you still have teeth. <laughs> uh, Cynthia reminds us that a fool and his money are soon parted. Oh, there's your Nietzsche from Jennifer uh, Lechner there. The higher you soar the smaller you appear to those who cannot fly. Mm, yes. Very Jonathan Livingston Seagull there. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. Larry Mason says, better to be judged by 12 than carried by 6. Oof. <laughs> so, you know, defend yourself is the idea there. Right. And if uh, you defend yourself and end up taking to court for it, well, it's better to be judged by 12 than to be carried by 6 because you didn't defend yourself. Right. Mary Lean says... Three can keep a secret if two of them are dead. <laughs> yes, Benjamin Franklin. Very good. Yep, actions speak volumes. Once again, integrity there. Mm-hmm. And truth will out. Yep. Um, Erskine gave the uh, noble soul has reverence for itself, the quote that Ayn Rand used from Nietzsche. That's good. <laughs> Peter... Peter Johnson, he's so cool. He says, before you embark on a journey of revenge, dig two graves. <laughs> yes, classic. And, uh, yeah, well, that's the difference between defending yourself and seeking vengeance. Right. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It is better to light one small candle than to curse the darkness. Mm. I, don't, I, I, I know that one, but I don't remember where it's from. Robert Sharp left of that one. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And Rebecca had a bunch of great ones here, just real quick. It is a sign of weakness to avoid showing signs of weakness. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. The uh, most vulnerable man is the man who's afraid to be vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, she also said, people who choose, people will choose unhappiness over uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. That uh, And that's true, too. Yeah. Many false steps are made by standing still. Mm-hmm. Now, here's one that obviously sounds more like me. Talk to yourself like you would to someone you love. Ah, uh, yes. Love that one. And mm-hmm. I've heard that before. And then, um, this is great because she left this at Glocon. Oh, I didn't bring the board out. Should have done that. Oh, that's okay. We had a board of post-it notes at Glocon 2019 that folks left. Yeah. We gave everybody a chance to leave their own post-it note. And Rebecca left the one that says, Obstacles do not block the path. They are the path, mm-hmm. which uh, you know goes along with the idea that the best way out, or the uh, sometimes the only way out, is through. Yes, I think uh, Winston Churchill's credited with that one. The way out is through, mm-hmm. or is well, it just when he said that uh, if you're going through hell, keep going? Right, right. I mean, that's a good one for grief and such, uh, but also goes along with mine, my aphorism, which is. Don't step in it, step over it. <laughs> yes, that's true. Those are kind of two different things, but yeah, if, it, if you have the option to step over it, yes. Yes, what doesn't come out in the wash comes out in the rinse. It's also from Larry Mason. I have to think about that one. <laughs> hmm, let's think about this. <laughs> yeah, and then Dale has... Uh, A few good ones here from Aristotle. A friend to all is a friend to none. Right. Yeah, which is the idea that uh, you can't be true to everybody. True. And uh, happiness depends upon ourselves, Aristotle. Mm Mm-hmm. Or as Ayn Rand said, to say I love you, one must first be able to say the I. Of I love you. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. So good. Well, thank you so much for all of those. And we're watching more come in here. And I gotta say, aphorisms is what got me into philosophy to begin with, or wisdom, philosophy, whatever you want to call it. Oh, that's um, your Ashley this Brilliant is, um, book. Ashley Brilliant uh, is a gentleman um, who put together a uh, one-frame comic uh, called Pot Shots, and uh, 
you know, these are, this is an old book, um, but you can still buy them. They're out of print, but you have all of these different little one frame comics. I'll just say, um, uh, just, just funny things that sometimes are a little bit, um, off, but sometimes they're just perfect. Um, <laughs> just funny things, uh, you know. And anyway, I, I don't, I won't go into them or anything like that. But they're very, very fun, and they have a little illustration next to them. Oh, I'll add a couple to the show notes. I know yeah. we found a few of them online, and we had shared them at one point. Yes. So it's good stuff. Ashley, brilliant. And I have some aphorisms too. Um, let's see here. This one is actually a really nice one. It's by uh, Voltaire, mm -hmm. um, who is one of my heroes in life. <laughs> Love you, Voltaire. Oh, my yes. gosh. Um, the um, the man in France of the Enlightenment. Yes. He's an Enlightenment guy. Renaissance man. Yes. We visited his grave. We did. In uh, the Pantheon. Yes. Or, Not the yes. Parthenon, but the Pantheon. <laughs> so, in Paris, and that's France. in Paris, yep. Uh, so the, all the quote is, is, let us cultivate our garden. Let us cultivate our garden. And what, uh, according to, I think it was dictionary.com, basically it's, it's the moral of his book, Candide. Basically, take care of your own and the world will take care of itself. Um, it's the ninety. It's the ninety seventh uh, dash three rule of uh, take cultivate your garden first, and then worry about uh, taking care of others or responding to them or fighting them or however. Um, but yes, let us cultivate our garden. It's just love yeah. it. it. Reminds me of the dictionary definition of benevolence. We were a little surprised to see how they referred to wealth. Mm -hmm. that, that benevolence is associated with wealth. Yes. But it turns out that makes sense because the ability to be good to anyone else depends on you having achieved some degree of success. You have something to give. Yes. Another one from Voltaire is, think for yourself and let others enjoy the privilege of doing so too. Think for yourself and let others enjoy the privilege of doing so too. Yes. Good. And appreciation is a wonderful thing. It makes what is excellent in others belong to us as well. Yes. That's so, great. Yes. That's spiritual trade right there. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing about it is that it, it adds at no cost. Right. It costs you nothing to see somebody else's achievement and to tell them that you admire and appreciate it. It's a gift. I the know. The best gift you can give and it costs you nothing. Right. It is, uh, what is it, Ayn Rand's um, quote is, the greatest gift a person can receive is the sight of an achievement. It goes along with that. Well, speaking of Ayn Rand, mm -hmm. since we're talking about aphorisms, yes, I've got to say that aphorisms as wisdom, mm -hmm. as motivation, as inspiration is not enough. It is not enough. As a matter of fact, uh, Peter here on YouTube, yes. um, he says, I've found it interesting that there are some aphorisms or proverbs that provide opposite advice. And then he puts like a little angry emoji next to it. That's true. Absolutely. Well, some aphorisms are actually bad, even, yes. though they, even though they might sound good. <laughs> right. And some aphorisms are floating. Yes. Unless you have an underlying value and and more broadly a philosophic base a, yeah structure a philosophical structure if the philosophy that underlies your wisdom is errant then your results will be bad it will not lead you to success so right. personally i recommend you read Ayn Rand yes if you haven't already i recommend this as well in which case her essay philosophy who needs it it's a great one is a very good place to start you can find that online there's a link in the show notes mm -hmm. and the uh, link takes you to a page where you can actually listen to her deliver the lecture uh, to the uh, class of 76 at West Point or you can just read it if that is your preferred way of taking that in I love aphorisms because so much wisdom is condensed in as the definition says into a terse format Mm -hmm. And that makes it easy to call on it when you need it. 
Yes. When you need to be reminded. It's a little less broad than a philosophic principle, and you need philosophic principles. But it's also a little more dirty in the mm -hmm. sense of having your fingers in the dirt, in the sense of being in the world, in life. Mm -hmm. And so I love me a good aphorism. I hope you found <laughs> some of these inspirational, motivational, instructive, useful. I'm sure you all have your own as well. And thank you for sharing yours. This, I love it. It was so much fun reading these this week and tonight. Yes. It was so, so good. So yes, thank you for that. And your homework. Mm, homework. Yes, we do have homework this week. I skipped a week. We didn't have any homework last week. Mm -hmm. Your homework this week is to make a list of your own aphorisms. Now, some of you have already left a few of them. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're already done or halfway done. But make a list of your own aphorisms, proverbs, maxims, epigrams. A minimum of two. Mm -hmm. I always seem to say two. Minimum of two, maximum of 20. Okay. And if you haven't already, mm -hmm. and a lot of you have, share them. Yes. Share them with us online. Share them in the group or share them on my wall. Yep. Share them on our YouTube page. And uh, that is your homework. If you would be willing to do that, we would uh, we would love to, love to read them. Love to know the kinds of things that help you keep moving in the right direction. Yep. I do have a post-it note for the week. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm wearing red stripes, sort of, and uh, drinking hot chocolate. <laughs> See, we skipped Christmas this week. It came up in St. Nicholas and a couple of things, but yeah. we're talking about aphorisms. We're not talking about the holiday. So my mm -hmm. post-it note for the week says, Christmas is the time to say, I love you. <laughs> this was a, a ridiculous Christmas song that came out in the 80s by the uh, rock musician Billy Squire. It was the kind of song, every time I heard it, I would either turn it off or I would just wince. And the funny <laughs> thing is, 20 years later, 20, 30 years later, now... I actually kind of like it, uh huh. and I actually like the sentiment. Good. Because, you know, we said that expressing admiration costs you nothing. Mm -hmm. well, it has a cost. It costs you your words. It costs you move, opening your mouth. But it also costs you whatever reservations you had, whatever your hesitation was, if you mm -hmm. felt like it was inappropriate for you to approach this great creator or this friend of yours and say these things. And saying I love you is kind of the same. Mm, yes. We don't say I love you to our friends. And maybe we shouldn't. Maybe yeah. that would be too weird. We, there, I, I say I love you to uh, yes, you do. my friends. Mm -hmm. And so all I would say is, yeah, don't say I love you to your checkout clerk at the grocery store, <laughs> even if you feel it. <laughs> you don't walk, walk into Costco and see a greeter saying, welcome to Costco. I love you. But yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's like an idiocracy. That was such a great sequence. It was the best. Welcome to Costco. I love you. You know, eventually greeters will be doing that, right? <laughs> but Christmas, as Billy Squire, the philosopher Billy Squire, teaches us, Christmas is the time to say I love you. So I'm going to remind myself to tell people what I think of them even more often than I do. And I would encourage everybody out there to do the same thing. Yes. And, uh, oh, by the way... I love you. I love you too. Wait, are you saying you love me too, or are you saying you love them too? Both. Both. <laughs> well, that's that's that answer works for me. Good. <laughs> so, with that said, I'm just going to remind you real quick. Mm -hmm. Show notes for this episode will be online within five to ten minutes after the episode. Questions and comments can be left at the 5 Minutes with Robert Nacer Facebook group. If you want to support the show financially, why would you do that? It's Christmas time. Yes. And some of you already do. Thank you so much. We love you. We love you. We love you. And we accept Christmas gifts. And we accept Christmas gifts. Yes, we do. If you want to support the show, <laughs> patreon.com slash Robert Nacer, or send me a Facebook message for a PayPal address if you prefer that route. And also get on our Christmas card list if you're not already. Send us a message with your mailing address and we will be sure to send you a Christmas card. Yes. They're not fancy cards, but at least we're writing messages in each one in genuine handwriting. Which sounds funny, but we had a friend who used to actually do that with a computer and he'd print it on a piece of paper and then tape the piece of paper inside the card. And it was funny because the first time it happened, we thought, oh my God, what did he do? And after a few years, it became really endearing and we started looking forward to these funny 
computer printouts that he would tape to the inside yeah, of a greeting uh, card. But that's late, not what you're going to get from us. The late, great Bob Carbonell. The late, great Bob. Oh, what a guy. <laughs> that's not what you're going to get from us. You will get something where I will actually write in the card. So send us your mailing address if you want to be on our Christmas card list. And with that said... Do we have any other comments we need to recognize oh, or respond to? Oh, we are to? so... I'm responding to them, but we're getting oh, so much Oh, you're doing love. it in print. Okay. Yes. Well, wonderful. Yes. Yeah, so um, I love you, Jennifer. I love you, Angie. I love you, Linda and Quent. Well, Linda. Oh. Well, Linda, you silly thing. Did you think I haven't already sent you a card? Okay. So <laughs> with that said, I guess it hasn't gotten there yet. Thank you so much for joining us. We're getting closer to Christmas. The love is in the air. The smell of cinnamon and pine is in the air. Oh, yes. We're probably going to get sillier as the weeks go by and start <laughs> saying, oh, I love you all the time and all that silly stuff. And I hope you can forgive us, but I'm sure we'll be our rotten and crusty selves after December 25th. <laughs> no, we won't. We're going to keep We're going to keep uh, the spirit of Christmas in our hearts and minds throughout the year. Oh, that's right. We did commit to that, didn't yes. we? Yes. Oh, well. All right. The love's going to keep on coming. So with that said, thank you so much for joining us. Can't tell you how much that means to us. We wish you, and I do mean you, the person listening to my voice right now, we wish you success. We wish you happiness and flourishing. We wish you the wisdom of aphorisms that you keep in your back pocket and can pull them out anytime you need them. And as always, we wish you love.